The Disappearing L, Erasure of Lesbian Spaces and Culture by Bonnie J. Morris. Chapter 4, Imagining an Eruv. <clears throat> Quote, In Orthodox synagogues, where the mahitzvah, the participation of synagogues separating men from women, tends to reinforce the inequality of the sexes rather than allow for separate but equal prayer. An intermediate and temporary step may be the formation of a woman's minion. A woman's minion is an interim solution at best. A total separation, a totally separatist solution is not what the covenant community is all about. Moreover, a separate minion will continue to be satisfying only for a small number of women. End quote. Blue Greenberg on Women and Judaism. Quote, It's the worst sort of insult to accuse him of, of being her deadliest enemy. Calling separatists fascist is also anti-Semitic because it denies the existence of Jewish dyke separatists who are courageously all about out about being both separatist and Jewish. End quote. Bev Joe, Dykes Loving Dykes. Quote, when you are a first, you are expected to be an expert in everything, end quote. Rabbi Sally Present, Judaism and the New Woman. Jewish women forge new communities of their own during the second wave of American feminism. The three quotes above show wide variety in approach and leadership. The Orthodox wife of an Orthodox rabbi discovered her own feminism, a radical lesbian separatist defended Jewish women's roles in lesbian separatism. The first woman ordained as a recognized rabbi in the United States acknowledges the burden of being a feminist role model. There were certainly no one approach to carving slices of Jewish feminism from the patriarchal loaf. As Jewish women take leading roles in constructing American feminism, lesbians took a lead in forming unique spaces for Jewish women's visibility. This chapter examines Jewish lesbians at the helm of activism. Throughout most of the 20th century, mainstream religious organizations opposed efforts by lesbians and gay men to gain full civil rights. Of course, there were important exceptions, such as the Sympathetic Council on Religion and the Homosexual, formed in San Francisco in 1964, with the support of lesbian activists Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. By 1972, Beth Chaim Kadashim in Los Angeles was the nation's first gay and lesbian synagogue. And throughout the 1970s, from the Metropolitan Community Church to New York's Congregation Simcha's Torah and San Francisco's Sha'ar Zahav, from Dignity, LGBT Catholics, to Affirmation, LGBT Mormons, People of faith created spiritual shelters for those still unwelcome in their home congregations. Simultaneously, the feminist movement also exposed how religious beliefs and institutions kept women in second place. By the early 1980s, two of the most popular speakers at lesbian conferences and music festivals were critics Mary Daly, author of Beyond God the Father, The Church and the Second Sex, and Gynecology, and Sonia Johnson a one-time homemaker excommunicated from, her L excommunicated from her LDS church for supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. She eventually ran for President of the United States. In 1990, ex-holiness preacher Wanda Henson and her partner Brenda Henson co-founded an entire retreat, the Gulf Coast Women's Festival, later called Camp Sister Spirit, to offer other Southern lesbians refuge from fundamentalism. Standing between the forces of feminist criticism and the possibility of LGBT-friendly worship, Jewish lesbians started their own movement, with concerns rooted in an ethnic and cultural heritage that had survived legacies of hate. Jewish lesbian activists, who were already invested in organizing, performing, or publishing by the 1970s, had a built-in platform for advocacy and used such venues to explore their own identities as Jews. Their questions and alliances soon became a significant part of the LGBT movement's growing diversity. Where are those Jewish lesbian sites and spaces now? 
How will they be remembered? I had a front row seat to this personal revolution, one I gladly jumped out to accept a leadership role. For 15 years, 1991 through 2005, my job at the Michigan Women's Music Festival was setting up and staffing a pleasant central space for Jewish women to meet. Over those years, thousands of Jewish women, most but not all, lesbian identified, visited the Jewish tent. Campers, their children, performers, even performers' mothers and grandmothers visiting the festival, all expressed gratitude for the opportunity to network, argue, celebrate, pray, and flirt with other Jewish feminists. It was an era of dynamic Jewish lesbian activity, not just at Michigan, but at most other festivals and conferences. Therefore, non-Jewish women, too, had their eyes and minds opened by images such as a white-haired lesbian rapping to fill in, and two leather-clad women inscribing marriage vows on a hand-lettered ketubah scroll, or a very pregnant cantor at the microphone belting out Yiddish soul as the band Divan incited thousands of to dance the horror of. The old joke, two Jews, three opinions, is an accurate portrait of the Jewish lesbian movement as it blossomed during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Few women brought just one Jewish identity stance to a gathering. Some, primarily identifying as feminists, wanted a safe place to rage against institutionalized Orthodox Judaism, while others sought to unburden the homophobia and rejection they'd experienced as lesbians in their home synagogues. And many wanted to address anti-Semitism anti-Semitism they'd encountered in the progressive women's community, especially in the context of anti-racist work. But at festivals, an impressive number of women also showed up as committed Jews, eager to share how they were creatively weaving traditional Jewish beliefs and practices into their lesbian lives. These were the women in labrys emblazoned kippah and rainbow talit, so ready to celebrate Shabbat at a women's music festival that they brought photocopied sheets of Hebrew prayers adapted into feminine liturgical language for everyone to share. The possibility of being both Jew and lesbian in a supportive environment definitely brought strong feelings to the surface, tears, gratitude, and re-engagement with faith. In that spirit, one woman attending the Michigan festival approached me early in the 1990s with this question. May we have an Eruv around the land? What's an Eruv? It's a boundary marker, subtly surrounding otherwise public spaces to identify them as temporary extensions of the home. For traditional Orthodox community, an Eruv may consist of twine or wire strung across certain light poles and roofs, making an entire neighborhood a household during Shabbat and holidays. This is done to permit certain physical activities, such as moving or carrying items from place to place which would otherwise be prohibited as work on, ho on holy days. The Eruv is an unintentionally feminist custom. It facilitates women's communal participation, especially mothers of young children. Women who must push a baby stroller or carry diapers if they are to leave the house simply cannot visit friends and relatives on their own one day of the rest, on their own one day of rest, unless an Eruv lets them carry and push inside an acceptable area. Of course, in the modern world, it's as much a necessity as a convenience for men, too, to be able to carry house keys or a pocket full of hearing aid batteries on Saturday without feeling like they've defied the Almighty. The Eruv also draws a secret circle around members of an observant Jewish community. Though probably unnoticed by the non-Jew passing through, it shivers around the practices of believers. In my role at the Michigan Festival, I met many Jewish women who were already very comfortable stretching the boundaries of Orthodox tradition by living as lesbians, attending goddess-centered services in the woods, or occasionally leaping shirtless into a country and Western dance workshop. But some, coming from a traditional upbringing nonetheless, wanted to be Shomer Shabbat, to observe the Sabbath laws, while roughing it in an enormous festival. Under conditions where four to 6,000 women lived in dome tents scattered across 650 acres for a week, nearly everyone made multiple trips back and forth to their campsites all day long, 
fetching and carrying concert chairs, coolers, changes of clothes, rain gear, etc. Moreover, every festigoer was obligated to do a set of work shifts, ideally in the kitchen, and that meant a Jewish woman might be working on a Saturday serving food, work that would be allowable if the main kitchen area counted as an extension of one's home. The religious women who approached me knew that an Eru around the festival would immediately designate the land as one big private household, permitting other observant Jewish festigoers to haul around anything they liked during the night and day of Shabbat. So, while aware that I lacked the rabbinical authority to do so, I temporarily ordained myself Rav Morris and declared an Eru around Michigan. I watched sheer spiritual relief flood the faces of the young women before me, like countless other displaced Jews before her. As a traveler of a strange new land, she had figured out how to bring traditional practices into radical surroundings. Yet she had done much more than that. With her simple request, she had temporarily turned the entire festival into Jewish space. This incident started me thinking about the many ways in which Judaism, with its emphasis on separation and differences and tribal rules, offered a handy model for looking at lesbian and gay assimilation. How had the LGBT community both embraced and resisted being mainstreamed into American culture? Do heterosexuals, whether allies or opponents, even see the Eru we lesbians sometimes cast about ourselves? How do we enforce our own community boundaries or practices? For both Jews and lesbians, which authentic practices are quickly abandoned when we gain power? Do we critique as improper for freed people, the lingering hints of self-imposed ghetto mentalities? When do we seek landmark boundaries of otherness again as refuge or protection? These questions will be revisited in the following final chapter. For some Jews, that safe and landmarked boundary is Israel. For some lesbians, it's been the women-only space of the Michigan Festival. By the late 1990s, both locations had become so controversial and so contested that to mention one's ongoing affiliation with either brought stern rebuke from other progressives. Could one feel connected with the state of Israel while criticizing its policies too? Of course, didn't most LGBT Americans feel that way about their own unfair government? Could one go to the Michigan Festival as a lesbian and nonetheless advocate for greater inclusion of trans women? Of course, by, and by the way, the struggle for trans inclusion also began with Jewish leadership from Leslie Feinberg to Kate Bornstein to Joe Layden. But the burden of having two sacred spaces under attack led many Jewish lesbians to retreat from so much contested visibility. By 2005, there were not enough women attending the festival or gathering in the Jewish tent to sustain the program I had started at Michigan. It exists in memory now. The Jewish lesbian movement is yet another chapter of dynamic activism vanishing from what we remember or inscribe about recent LGBT history. As shown above, there's much to be learned from the framework of Jewish women daring to come out. For one thing, this movement took many of its supposed allies by surprise. Participating in progressive activism was hardly new to Jewish liberals. However, wearing a lapel pin announcing loud, proud Jewish dyke was a new style of in-your-face cultural, cultural provocation, baffling to some older Jews whose choices for shocking their own parents had been limited to Hasidism, Communist Party membership, and the Borscht Belt comedy circuit. For my mother, who dove right off the Jewish family tree by marrying a, gen a Gentile and raising her children with Christmas stockings and Easter baskets, assimilation and intermarriage were already thrilling acts of rebellion, transgression, and agency. Her yearning to be a mainstream American overpowered any identification with feminism, though she gladly marched in one anti-war protest after another during the turbulent 1960s. As a good Jewish mother, her first response to my coming out was that it wasn't safe. People might hate me or hurt me, or worst of all, not employ me. Why cause trouble when I had a bright future? 
More confusing to her still was my plan to major in Jewish women's history in college and graduate school. Here I was, culturally climbing back into the Jewish family tree, but dating women. What did it mean to our mothers that this next generation of daughters, calling ourselves lesbians and rejecting traditional marriage and childbearing, nonetheless yearned to reclaim Jewish ritual practices, up to and including the right to become lesbian rabbis? Were we an embarrassment to or a renaissance of Jewish life in America? We weren't sure either. Gradually, the lesbian identifying Jewish daughters weren't looking for one another to compare our stories, endlessly crossing back and forth between radicalism and authenticity. Oh, okay. Gradually, the lesbian identifying Jewish daughters went looking for one another to compare our stories, endlessly crossing back and forth between radicalism and authenticity. Okay. These vibrant exchanges within the Jewish lesbian movement are what we risk forgetting, despite a rich legacy of publications, music recordings, humorists, and controversy. For all these reasons, the familiar timeline from invisibility to pride to a cultural fade out and our collective amnesia about what happened, we need to look at those women who built a political language from Jewish lesbian identity. They are a complex tribe, this bunch that I belong to. The Seeds of a Jewish Lesbian Movement Jewish women of all backgrounds certainly flocked to the women's question when it entered public debate in the early 1960s. Both second-wave feminism and lesbian culture in the United States benefited from a high percentage of Jewish leaders and theorists, despite America's shrinking Jewish demographic. Never a large group to begin with, American Jews had decreased in numbers since the immigration surge of the Ellis Island era. By the time I was born in 1961, Jews made up less than 2% of the U.S. population due to lower post-war birth rates and rising rates of intermarriage and religious disaffiliation, sorry, disaffectation, trends that certainly included my own parents. Yet, this tiny minority group was disproportionately represented, both in the mainstream women's movement and in the more radical and cultural wings of lesbian feminism. Throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the roster of high-profile feminist and lesbian authors and activists overflowed with Jewish names. The second wave of women's liberation in the United States has long been associated with Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem, Bella Abzug and Shulamith Firestone, and Phyllis Chesler and Letty Pogrebin, to name just a half dozen icons. The rapid growth of a campus women's studies program and the institutionalization of women's history as a legitimate academic field also owed much to the success of scholarly Jewish women, including Rosalind Baxendahl, Renate Brindlethal, Eleanor Flexner, Gerda Lerner, Alice Kessler Harris, Ellen Levine, Kitty Sklar, Barbara. Warthenmeyer, and Bonnie Zimmerman. Some of these women had the additional perspectives of being Holocaust survivors. 
Women's bookstores held poetry readings for featuring the fierce writings of Grace Paley, Marge Piercy, Adrian Rich, Muriel Rex Reckiser. Against this background, Hebrew Union College, representing the reform wing of American Judaism, adorned America's first woman ra rabbi, Sally Priesen, in 1972. What fostered this astounding trend, this apparently limitless energy of Jewish feminists? The Jewish religion had rarely been kind to females who, in Orthodox tradition, were systematically restricted from nearly every public ritual. On the other hand, Judaism's emphasis on scholarship, justice, and outsider survival had long inspired revolutionary Jewish men to start new social movements that changed the world. Consider Christ, Marx, and Freud. When women finally rose up in a movement of their own, they did so in the spirit of Lilith, Esther, and Miriam. Many had learned their activist chops in the civil rights struggle of the late early of the late 1950s and early 1960s, foregoing early alliances with African American women in struggle. Some, such as folk singer Ronnie Gilbert, had also experienced investigated sorry, experience being investigated or banned during the McCarthy era. By the late 1970s, an entire new genre of books and journals addressed the subject of Jewish feminism and Jewish women's history, from memoir to academic scholarship. The diverse chorus of Jewish women's voices included Susanna Heschel's On Being a Jewish Feminist, Charlotte Baum, Paula Hyman, and Sonia Michaels' Jewish Women in America, Elizabeth Colton's The Jewish Woman, and Lilith Magazine. These writings addressed sexism in Jewish law and practice, but also offered models of female power and agency. And then, in 1982, came Evelyn Torton Beck's triumphant volume, Nice Jewish Girls, a lesbian anthology. The moment had come. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Coming out as Jewish in the lesbian community. I was in college, coming out as both lesbian and Jew, majoring in Jewish history and minoring in women's studies, when Beck's anthology arrived at Lama's, our local women's bookstore. Looking back, everything in my location and academic interests pointed to the inevitability of Jewish lesbian activism. My community in Washington, D.C., brought together almost too many role models for an enthusiastic 20-year-old. The Beltway connected the suburbs of Jewish Montgomery County with Jewish Baltimore, bringing students like me a very Jewish college, American University, where all my undergraduate women's history classes were taught by acclaimed Jewish feminists. Roberta Rubinstein, Muriel Cantor, Mira Sadker, Pam Nadel, Nadel. We were also unique in having a female pro-choice rabbi at AU, Rabbi Mindy Portnoy, who led services and brought in speakers, soon aspiring, inspiring my classmate Leah to become a feminist rabbi herself. In my classes, we read Dorothy Dinnerstein, Cynthia Ozick, Rosabeth Moss Cantor, Linda Kerber, Adrian Rich, Vivian Gornick, Rosalind Rosenberg, Emma Goldman, and Alice Kessler-Harris, who later became my teacher in graduate school. There was no debate over the role of smart Jewish women, either as shapers or teachers of history. Supposedly, there was a role model for everybody. Hannah Sinesh, parachuting behind enemy lines to liberate death camps. Elizabeth Holtzman, prosecuting former Nazis hiding in the outer boroughs of New York. The question for a Jewish undergraduate female was how many honors to pursue, which graduate program or law school to apply to. However, in all my studies, from those undergraduate years through graduate work, no one ever introduced the history or contributions of lesbians, Jewish or otherwise. With the exception of a few essays by Adrian Rich, neither the assigned readings nor the otherwise terrific professors 
in AU's new women's studies program, spoke about lesbian lives. That research took me off campus to the women's bookstore where I discovered there were works of scholarship about lesbians produced by Jewish lesbian scholars. I discovered Carla J. Lillian Federman, Esther Newton. I discovered that on both coasts, a mighty effort was underway to begin preserving lesbian community papers. And as ever, it was initiated by Jewish women. Deb Edel and Joan Nessel began the Lesbian History Archives right from their own New York apartment, and June Mazur launched what be later became the June Mazur Archives in California, now housed at the ACLU. By 1981, I was well acquainted with Jewish feminists who talked about feminism and Jewish lesbians who talked about lesbianism. But where were the Jewish lesbians who actually referenced their Jewishness? And that is why Evie Beck's book, Nice Jewish Girls, was like an explosion of chocolate. It was a sweetness, it was a luxury, and we couldn't get enough of it. We had to have more. Beck's anthology broke new ground, too, by going beyond the usual Ashkenazi narrative to include voices of Shepherdi and Yemenite Jewish women, and women who self-identified as witches and terror readers. Parties, readings, salons, Jewish lesbian delegations and pride marches and other events celebrating the book followed immediately. One such celebration was held at George Washington University on Octo in October 1982. Featuring appearances by Evelyn Torton Beck, local lesbian photographer J.E.B., Joan Byron, and comedian Sarah Citron. With ASL interpretation, the show included a program handout designed by artist Sudi Rakison, known for her lesbian goddess illustrations. The cover featured a Star of David overlaid with a labrys, the twining of identities that would be the theme of Jewish lesbian jewelry and pins for the next 20 years. From D.C. to Los Angeles, from Boston to Baltimore, from Toronto to Chicago, Jewish lesbians generated pride and visibility by forming study groups, workshops, new publications such as Bridges and the Tribe of Dinah, spiritual retreats like Benot Aish, and other support networks. Barely a year after the publication of Nice Jewish Girls, Barbara Streisand's film Yentl, appeared in theaters, sending the Jewish lesbian community into a collective swoon, a feminist storyline with cross-dressing Barbara poised to kiss Amy Irving. There was enough homoerotic subtext on screen to send every woman I knew rushing for ice water to cool herself down. In homage to the film's popularity and meaning, one study and support group in Ithaca adopted the name Lentil for lesbian eating and Torah learning. More books followed, including Susan Weidman Schreiner's Schneider's Jewish and Female. However, it's important to note that this era wasn't entirely a party. The appearance of a new minority within a minority threatened some of the very feminists who had most loudly declared their commitment to diversity in the movement. Performer Alex Dobkin, a well-known symbol of Jewish lesbian visibility, often remarked that it was harder for her to come out as a Jew than as a lesbian. An almost identical quote came from Evie Beck in Letty Cotton Pogrebin's Anti-Semitism in the Women's Movement, a controversy-sparking essay published in June 1982 in a June 1982 issue of Ms. Beck told Pogrebin, quote, when you're invisible, you lose your voice, but becoming visible opens you to attack. I found it easier to tell straight people I'm a lesbian than to tell some feminists I'm Jewish, end quote. From real estate covenants to college admission quotas, America's history had seeded legacies of anti-Semitism every bit as deep-rooted as, as homophobia. In coming out as both lesbian and Jew, Women negotiated the double whammy of homophobia in the synagogue 
and Jew baiting in the LGBT community. Both patriarchal religion and the modern state of Israel continue to be favored targets for progressive feminists, placing Jewish lesbians on the defensive in too many open dialogues. Through the rhetoric of radical feminism, critics insisted that all organized religion oppressed women or was incompatible with women's sexual autonomy. These were the activists who wondered aloud why any real lesbian would seek inclusion in the patriarchal synagogue portrayed in the Old Testament. It was also conveniently easy to blame Jewish law and custom for centuries of menstrual taboos, bans on homosexuality or other biases spelled out in Leviticus. Representing two threatened and oft misunderstood communities, Jewish lesbians who dared to come out in the 1970s and 80s were burdened with dual diplomatic roles as emissaries from two tribes, endlessly educating those unfamiliar with either Jewish or lesbian concerns of survival. The rapid gains of both feminism and LGBT visibility had also triggered backlash from the religious right, as a powerful new religious homophobia dominated the American political landscape. To be both Jewish and lesbian at the start of the Reagan era was to embody everything the moral majority opposed, as its constituents lobbied to embed conservative Christianity into the public sphere. Both Jews and members of the LGBT community readied for decades of political advocacy, battling for the right to cultural differences as well as the right to equal citizenship. Whether or not our progressive allies cared to admit it, the preponderance of Jewish women and men in the feminist and LGBT movements made key issues the target of anti-Semitic backlash. At various rallies I attended, crude posters waved by counter demonstrators blamed both abortion and AIDS on evil, quote unquote, Jewish doctors. Putting anti Semitism on the agenda of harmful isms to watch out for would have been a strategic necessity at feminist conferences, even if there had not been a strong presence of Jewish lesbians. Although both second and third wave feminism directed women to articulate how race, class, and ethnic heritage informed their self-knowledge, the Jewish women's peculiar intersectional experience and history remained a low priority. Unless directed to scrutinize and unlearn Jewish stereotypes, many lesbian activists operated on the assumption that Jews as a group were wealthy and white, if not outright landlords. These historic divisions between women dominated many lesbian events, reminding the participants that a shared sensibility of women-loving didn't and couldn't instantly erase global imbalances of power. At lesbian feminist conferences and music festivals, participants were asked to examine their own internalized oppression as women, but also to engage in the work of unlearning harmful stereotypes toward women from different backgrounds. 
This well-intended but difficult process was rarely smooth and often very contentious, particularly with the language of direct action shifted from unlearning racism or classism to interrupting racism or classism. Interrupting could and did happen in very bullying ways, booing and hissing performers, silencing speakers. Women who were both glib and, in certain cases, opportunistic, appropriated power and leadership simply by accusing others of being oppressive. But these displays were not necessarily new. Similar tactics of public shaming may have been seen throughout women's history. Accusing a neighbor of being a witch in medieval France or of being a bourgeois counter-revolutionary during Mao's Cultural Revolution allowed otherwise disempowered women to raise their own status. Much has been written elsewhere about misguided political correctness in the women's movement. The public demonization or trashing of a lesbian feminist by her sisters made a poor impression on newly out lesbians, many of whom decided they wanted nothing to do with feminist politics. Much has been written elsewhere about misguided political correctness in the women's movement. Oh, wait. But others settled in for the long haul of process and acceptance and accepted the occasional ego bruise that come with serious anti-racism work and self-scrutiny. Having affirmed ethnic identity as a platform from which any woman might speak authentically, most organizers of lesbian events and editors of lesbian publications gradually made room for Jewish voices. And then there was the women's music scene. Being Jewish in festival culture. The women's music movement, too, began with Jewish leadership. Two of the first feminist rock groups, both of which played on the 1972 album Mountain Moving Day, were the Chicago Women's Liberation Rock Band with Susan Abbott, Stephanie Hirsch, and Naomi Weinstein, and the New Haven Women's Libera Liberation Rock Band with Susan Abbott's sister, Jennifer Abbott, plus Federica Alper, Harriet Cohen, and Leah, Leah Margulies. In that same year, Jewish stand-up comedian Robin Tyler produced Maxime Feldman's groundbreaking lesbian 45 RPM recording, Angry at This, the flip side of which was Amazon, to this day the opening anthem of the Michigan Women's Music Festival. In 1973, Alex Dobkin released Lavender Jane Loves Women, the first full-length lesbian album ever recorded. Back in my city of Washington, D.C., Jenny Burson, left the lesbian separatist Furies Collective and joined with Judy DeGlatz to form an independent women's music collective called Olivia. 
They soon, soon relocated to the West Coast, and in 1974, Olivia Records produced Meg Christensen's first and most famous I Know You Know album. Judy DeGlatz eventually expanded Olivia into the hugely successful travel company it is today, creating the first all-lesbian cruise ship experience for women. Whether or not a women's music festival, concert, or conference planned on including narratives of Jewish women's history, Jewish women were very dominant both on stage and behind the scenes. In most cases, the tribe was literally running the show. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, it was possible to attend any women's music festival and randomly encounter an all-Jewish lineup on stage. Alex Dobkin, Sue Fink, Frank, Maxine Feldman, Marla Beebe, Lynn Lavner, Laura Burson, Ronnie Gilbert, Sonia Rushteen, Debbie Fire, Jean Feinberg, comedians Judith Sloan and Sarah Cit Citron. The stage lighting might be designed by K.C. Cohen and assisted by Lauren Heller, the sound engineer engineered by Karen Kane, and or provided by Pan Conrad and Lori Bennett. On the stage might be managed by Brynna Fish, with MC humor offered by Amy and Elizabeth Ziff of Betty, and the entire festival produced by a Jewish lesbian, Amy Horowitz, Havens Levitt, Robin Tyler, Lynn Daniels. The distribution of the women's music for sale at many festivals was handled by Lori F Fuchs, Fuchs, who started the Lady Slipper Company and Mail Order Catalog. In the 2002 film, Radical Harmonies, Fuchs expressed the ex exhaustion of her early years in the wry Yiddish terms. We just schlepped albums from one place to another. Those hungry to keep up with the other trends in women's music could read a great feminist rock journal called Bitch, edited by the late Lori Twersky. And by 1984, the women's music movement in America had inspired Israeli lesbian activist Leora Muriel to start an international women's festival in Israel, despite complications. Quote, The symphony orchestra had no problem with playing women's music, but its conductor didn't believe anyone would come to a program of all unknown women's music, end quote. They did, and Moriel and her partner, my high school classmate Susan Kirshner, became the first ever lesbian couple to come out on Israeli television. Much later, it would be the Reverend Jerry Falwell who led the charge that women's music festivals were a wicked Jewish enterprise. But this target was the more mainstream Lilith Fair, Named, of course, for Lilith. By 1999, Falwell's fundamentalist National Liberty Journal warned parents that, quote, many modern Jewish feminists observed Lilith as a figure that creates an equality for women. Many young people, no doubt, attend the Lilith Fair concerts not knowing the demonic legend of the mystical woman whose name the series manifests, end quote. Several festivals, the several festivals were held at rented Jewish summer camps, Camp Fest and the West Coast Women's Music Festival and Comedy Festival, the East Coast Lesbian Festival, the Northeast Women's Music Retreat, where festi goers might be greeted by the sight of an Israeli flag waving aloft from the camp's office building. At one festival where this caused a stir, MC Maxim Feldman solved the dispute by removing the flag to her own cabin door. Offstage, many workshops on goddess spirituality and Wicca were led by Jews. Starhawk, oh, really, Diane Stein, Ruth Barrett. Even sign language interpretation, which became an essential part of making all of festival culture accessible, provided to be a very Jewish field. The initiative to place ASL interpreters on stage first came from Susan Frondlick, who was soon to be joined by... Laurie Rothberg, Jody Steiner, Rissa Shaw, Jennifer Jacobs, 
Joy Duskin, Kat Dvar, Felice Shays, and Joan Watman. Festivals took the lead on assuring complete accessibility, but it's well worth noticing that the Americans with Disability Act was written by a Jewish lesbian, the lawyer Chai Feld Feldblum. None of these festival workers were devout practicing Orthodox Jews. All were required to work, perform, or operate electricity on Friday nights and Saturdays, which, of course, was when the majority of women attended festivals. However, women who were in both who were in fact both Orthodox and lesbian, soon found their way to some festivals, including some who had grown up in Hasidic families. Despite the range of Jewish talent, fear of backlash prevented many women from stating the obvious, that Jewish energy fueled much of the lesbian cultural activism. Only a few artists even mentioned their Jewishness on stage. Why cause trouble, one woman confided in me, after all, we're already accused of running the media. But there were certainly exceptions. During each of her own concerts, Alex Dobkin deliberately paused at the third song in her set to say, Jews and lesbians have much in common. We were never meant to survive. Singing, after that statement in Yiddish, Alex wove two threatened identities together, a first in Hitler's eye, a fist in Hitler's eye. Other artists also signified Frank, who started out as little Susie Gottlieb in Mar Vista neighborhood of West Los Angeles, had a press kit describing herself as your basic all-American Jewish lesbian folk singer and often performed the song Take Off Your Swastika. Pianist Laura Berkson sang lovingly of Miriam's journey. Comedian Judith Sloan's stage character Sophie invoked everybody's Jewish grandmother, and at one of the first festivals I ever attended in 1982, when many more Holocaust survivors were still living and daughters of survivors shared a unique affi affinity, I was privileged to hear the mother-daughter duo Davida Ish Ishatova and Henia Good Goodman on stage. Goodman, a survivor, often told her audiences that she had, quote, survived the death camps in order to play Chopin, end quote. But on the day stage at the Michigan Festival, she concluded her performance by adding, quote, and you are all so nice to me here, and I think I may try women, end quote. There was thunderous applause. The Jewish women were contributing to festival culture in huge numbers, but had no official means of meeting one another, was a strange predicament. In this same era, festival facilitators energetically reminded their audiences to let go of stereotypes. Not all women of color looked black. Some able-bodied appearing women using campsites or food lines for the physically challenged had hidden disabilities. Jewish women who didn't look Jewish were another stereotype-defying group, searching for our table in order to eat lunch together at the Lesbian Diversity Banquet. But even we couldn't always discern who or how many we were. We might boldly assume most other women at festivals were lesbians or open to lesbianism, but who was Jewish? Passing was a mixed blessing, as Alan Frappin wrote in The Advocate. Quote, Imagine that you are a member of a minority that has been persecuted for centuries, sometimes to death, often by people citing the Bible as their excuse. Imagine further that because your status is not usually outwardly obvious, you can, if you wish, pass as a member of the majority. And finally, imagine that while the persecution has abated significantly in the second half of this century, it can still crop up anywhere, anytime. Now you know what it feels like to be Jewish. End quote. Okay. When festivals were held at Jewish summer camps, sometimes festigoers were actual alumni of those summer programs. That was one way to start a conversation, maybe in food lines or cabins. Some women wore knitted kippah. Two Jewish festival producers, Robin Tyler and Lynn Daniels, did schedule Jewish lesbian workshops and tent spaces in their festival programs, 
and were criticized for doing so. One anonymous letter accused Daniel of cultural nepotism. Supposedly, the East Coast Lesbian Festival offered too much Jewish visibility. The way most Jewish women met, however, was at spontaneously organized, feminist-themed Shabbat services, which often drew participants who were not religious but relished the ingathering of Shvezdern sisters. An equally reliable means of gathering Jews might be a commitment ceremony held under a forest chippa. Some homegrown festival weddings in that very long era before gay marriage became legal anywhere, delivered a powerful cultural message that Jewish tradition and lesbian love could surely coexist. The issue of having a separate space came up continually in the late 1980s when festivals were tackling issues of racism and or providing specific areas for women of color. Were Jewish women women of color? Yes, some were, much to the edification of both white and black activists who had not always been exposed to Jews from Moroccan, Sephardi, Iranian, Yemenite, Turkish, Cuban, and South American communities. While dark-skinned Jewish women networked around issues of racism, white-appearing Ashkenazi Jews were expected to stay out of the women of color workshops, yet there was no designated space for addressing anti-Semitism as a form of racism. In one effort to accommodate everyone's needs, the Michigan Festival temporarily scheduled a support group for Jewish women in Oasis, the emotional healing tent. This left women feeling that we were somehow in recovery from problems of Jewishness. There was no consensus. Should Jewish women ask for a separate space, or for clearer public presentations of Jewish feminism? The same issue simmered in Orthodox circles too, well beyond lesbian festival gates. Around this time, Blue Greenberg was writing her book on women and Judaism, insisting that, quote, to me, distinctiveness and not separation is the Jews' calling, end quote. Even talking about the quest for a separate space was done in hushed tones. Why? when other activists grabbed the stage microphone to demand accommodation. Lesbian poet and Holocaust survivor Irina Klepfis had already addressed these feelings in a 1981 essay for the New York City's Woman News. It was reprinted in Beck's anthology's Nice Jewish Girls. Quote, Am I afraid that by focusing on anti-Semitism I am being divisive? Do I feel that by asking other women to deal with anti-Semitism, I am draining the movement of precious energy that would be better used elsewhere? Do I have strong disagreements with and or am ashamed of Israeli policies and as a result don't feel I can defend Jews wholeheartedly against anti-Semitism? What Jewish stereotype am I afraid of being identified with? What do I repress in myself in order to present such identification? End quote. As time passed and the Michigan Festival had both a sanctuary tent for women of color and a well-attended Sunday morning gospel celebration, there were clear calls for Jewish women's events on the land. Where and how might our tribe meet? One view was that adding a Jewish space was in keeping within Michigan's radical mission, which had always been incorporating women-identified and centered spiritual practices. Wiccan events and goddess rituals were led by practitioners as varied as Kay Gardner, Zed Budapest, and Ruth Barrett. But no one was certain where Jews might fit, since many were actively anti-religious. Later, performer Leah Zakari lampooned the dilemma in her short play called White Girl with Guitar.
Leah, here's the tent for goddess worshippers. Where's the tent for Christians? I like to pray before I perform. Annie, we don't allow the religions of the patriarchy on the land. Leah, isn't that against the First Amendment? Annie, not at a women's music festival. Leah, but you have a Jewish lesbian tent. Judaism is the patriarchal precursor to Christianity. Annie, that's different. It's the Jewish left-handed lesbian daughter of Russian socialist tent. They are against all religion. Leah, then why do they bother to mention their Jewishness? Annie, to get oppressed group status at the festival. That's so women who come from minority or other oppressed cultures can attend the festival at a lower price. I first approached the Michigan Festival about a Jewish tent in summer 1989. In response, I received a warm two-page handwritten letter from producer, producer Lisa Vogel in October suggesting that, quote, as we review the community center's schedule, it seems probable and preferable to include daily space there for Jewish women to network and meet. I'll definitely bring it to the community center planning meetings, end quote. The turning point came in 1990 when I was 29 and fresh out of graduate school, having completed my dissertation on Hasidic women. I was now teaching the first ever graduate seminar on Hasidic women at Harvard and touring the East Coast with my one woman play about Jewish women's identity. I brought the play to Michigan as an open workshop in August, 1990, when hundreds of women showed up and afterward took over a table in front of the community center in order to make our group visible to all. I offered to take on the responsibility of institutionalizing a Jewish women's program at Michigan. Certain painful events over the next year forced additional discussions about Jewish women's exclusion or invisibility. Despite the efforts of several Jewish festivals to create a welcoming space, and my opportunity to join as anti, an anti-oppression work group called Numer, the Northeastern, oh sorry, at Numer, the Northeast Women's Music Retreat. Two significant conferences thoroughly bungled my representation of Jewish lesbians. These events were Audre Lorde's I Am Your Sister Conference in Boston in fall 1990 and the National Lesbian Conference in Atlanta in spring 1991. At I Am Your Sister, which addressed diverse issues of racism, Jewish women were very active as volunteer organizers and participants, but anti-Semitism was not raised as a form of racism in any conference planneries. Despite the presence of many nationally known Jewish feminists, the conference's first reference to Jews was negative. It came during an open mic speak out on the very last day when one participant took the microphone and denounced racist Jewish women. Jewish women were then roundly booed until the Native American writer and activist Christos interrupted, rising to declare her experiences of solidarity with innumerable Jewish women in the anti-racism movement. The Jewish women writers attending were then hastily invited to read their work in our room, but this invitation came so late in the conference that no one present had anything prepared. Far more disturbing was the incident in Atlanta six months later, in spring 1991, when lesbians gathered for a now notoriously stressful national conference. Here, the organizers did include Jewish women's events, and visibility translated into our using an actual conference theater 
for the Friday night Shabbat service. For some women, it was their first all-lesbian Shabbos. But as the conference plenary sessions were so tightly scheduled, other women awaiting the next event began to drift into the auditorium well before the Shabbat ritual had concluded on stage. One or two non-Jewish women began harassing those still encircled in song, shouting, Enough of this Jewish business! Why should the Jews get all the attention? We are sick of having this Jewish shit crammed down our throats. And the conference has no right giving official space to religion. The taunting continued until those on stage were forced to exit, some tearfully. Women's studies professor Bet Tallinn scolded one heckler, you better watch your anti-Semitism. And the response was, we're not anti-Semitic, we're anti-Zionist. Another woman shouted that she had objected, she was objecting on behalf of the Palestinian women. But there had been no mention of Israel in the women-centered service that night. There had instead been songs of peace. I wrote in my journal that night, quote, Scary, extraordinary, to sit at plenaries amid lesbians I know are opposed to the inclusion of a Shabbat service. What do we do? I went to a meeting of, a Jew of Jewish dykes, all at the boiling point of rage from being heckled, sat with Irina Klepfis. There was a general consensus that the Jew baiting here had been palpable. All of us were terrified and yet almost relieved to have it out in the open. That is, we are not, after all, paranoid or delusional. End quote. April 27th, 1991. The incident was particularly distressing because the populist Klansman and anti-Semite David Duke was campaigning that same year to be elected governor of Louisiana, and some Jewish women we knew had been afraid to travel to the South for the National Lesbian Conference event. In response, Ellie Barbarash, co-founder of the New York anti-racism group AWARE, published an open letter to the progressive lesbian community in Off Our Backs, detailing the many ways she had observed Jewish lesbians being marginalized at NLC, National Lesbian Conference. At least one lesbian writer published a different letter in The Village Voice, complaining about having to see the Shabbat ceremony staged at NLC. During this same year, 1991, Letty Cotton Pogrebin published Deborah, Golda, and Me, Being Female and Jewish in America, revisiting the backlash she'd endured after publishing her 1982 essay in Ms. Spring 1991 also saw writer Thyme Siegel publishing Anti-Jewish Oppression in Progressive Movements in the Journal of Anything That Moves. It was clear that Jewish women needed the support of other coalitions at lesbian events, but a certain privacy as well for more intimate rituals such as Shabbat. This dovetailed with my own goals. In the same month that Ellie Barabash's, sorry, Barabash's letter appeared in print, I had approval from the Michigan Festival to staff an official Jewish women's table in the community center. I was a Michigan worker at last. I began in 1991 by bringing handouts, song sheets, and materials on Jewish women's goals, global activism, to distribute from a simple table in the festival's community center. This formed a library I took back and forth to festival for the next 15 years, not daring to trust fragile photos and other documents to the winter mold of worker storage after after two weeks of summer damp, dust, and sun. Two large scrapbooks held photos of Jewish workshops and ceremonies held at Michigan and other festivals, and articles I collected year-round on Jewish lesbian identity, the LGBT movement in Israel, film festivals and artist tours, syllabi from women teaching Jewish women's studies courses, and found scholarship about Jewish heroines of the past. I also brought a small lending library, posters, mounted on scrapped plywood from the carpenter's tent, donated by the Jewish Women's Archive. 
Shabbat candles, chicken soup cubes, and information sheets for non-Jewish festigoers. Anticipating many of the more common questions, why do we have a Jewish space at Michigan? A very, part, a very important part of each year was a fresh blank journal laid out for visitors' comments and suggestions. Blank on arrival, but scrawled to bursting with advice, gratitude, and networking contact info by the festival's end. The table took on a life of its own. One of the most touching tributes to its importance was the Rosh Hashanah card written in English, Yiddish, and Hebrew by two Australian festigoers mailed from Australia with this address. Jewish Women's Table, Community Center, WWTMC, General Delivery, Hart, Michigan, USA. Women spelled with a Y and no zip code, and it made it from Victoria, Australia, all the way to my table in 1995. Soon, I was featuring news from Jewish lesbian communities in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Israel.
Within three years, we had definitely outgrown a table, and festival producer Lisa Vogo graciously consented to an official lesbian women's space on the land, a large tent that we split with another diaspora interest group, deaf women and interpreters. The latter, it turned out, mostly Jews. Having a tent of our own brought Jewish women from all over the world into daily discussions. Women from Israel, Italy, New Zealand, and England offered workshops on every topic from how to Devin with Tefillin to raising adopted children as Jews. The most popular workshop outside of the giant Friday night Shabbat gathering was stage workers Brina Fish's Jewish summer camp sing-along, an informal and nostalgic family hour on Saturday afternoons. One year, Yiddish song was an intensive workshop theme with voice practice led by Alex Dobkin's own mentor, Ethel Rehm, and discussions of Yiddish theater led by musician Eve Sicular of Metropolitan Klezmer. I helped set up everything from, from ketubah singing ceremony for two blushing brides to a ritual for a survivor of sexual abuse. Tears of joy and pride flowed when a young bat mitzvah girl stood up during the Shabbat service to thank her two moms for raising her without prejudice. Often, a much older woman, denied access to Torah learning as a young girl, finally got her chance to sing the blessing at our gatherings. One year, a deaf student from the Jewish Theological Seminary led us in a sign language Shabbat. Every single woman had strong feelings about how Shabbat should be structured, and it was nothing short of hilarious to hear nude anarchists insisting on traditional male pronoun blessings. I observed that even those festigoers ready for radical transformation of planetary patriarchy recoiled from the challenge of hearing a familiar blessing upgraded to God, she. Grammar, more than content, seemed a sacred convention. It's not just how I learned it's just not how I learned it in shul, wailed one bearded Amazon wearing nothing more than a loincloth and a drum, as if she herself were not embodying visible challenges to orthodox femininity. I learned that if God she is so difficult for so many of us to say, let alone envision, how much harder it is to dismantle other modes of thinking. In 1989, Marcia Falk addressed this issue in her essay Toward a Feminist Jewish Conscious reconstruction of monotheism. Our compromises in planning a Shabbat that would please everyone caught the interest of Kath Brown, a researcher from England who eventually profiled the Michigan Shabbat ceremony in her book, Queer Spiritual pra Spaces, Sexuality and Sacred Places. Free to practice a truly egalitarian Jewishness, many lesbians panicked and seeing women led what were once male-only traditions tested every feminist vision for change. The Orthodox feminist writer, Blue Green, wrote of her own struggle. Quote, In 1973, I was still able to say, women in the reform rabbinate, that's one thing, 
As for Orthodox me, I'll take my rabbi's mail, thank you. The first time I saw a woman draped in a prayer shawl, my instinctive reaction was Am Haaretz, Ignoramus. The first time I spotted a young woman wearing a kippah in the library of the Jewish Theological Seminary, I thought she was spoofing, and I tried to figure out why I was so uneasy. Was it because, once again, someone had crossed the lines? I know what my reaction will be on that day when I see some smart Alec women marching around with tzitzit, the ritual fringes worn by observant Jewish males, hanging out. Maybe if she is not some kind of exhibitionist, but rather a deeply religious Jew, eventually I'll overcome my palpitations and begin to consider what kind of a statement she is making. End quote. At Michigan, at Gulf Coast, at other festivals through the 1980s and 90s, I did see women in prayer shawls, kippah, tzitzit, and as more women entered rabbinical school throughout North America, such images even appeared in mainstream media pages. In 1996, the San Francisco Examiner magazine featured the photographs of Frederick Brenner, who posed female students at the Jewish Theological Seminary, wrapped in tefillin, and Jewish lesbian daughters of Holocaust survivors encircling with their mothers. My role as arbitrator slash facilitator at Michigan made me the go-to person for every camper's anxiety about innovations and exposures. Some women, fresh from religious communities, were overwhelmed by the casual nudity and sexuality on Michigan's private land and asked me why more wasn't done to protect the sensibilities of young daughters present. In contrast, other women frankly expected the Jewish tent to serve as a sort of matchmaking site. Still others were dismayed to learn that I had, at that time, a non-Jewish girlfriend. This did not prevent certain admirers from posing, posting love notes for me in the very public comments journal. How did the addition of Jewish spaces impact others attending or working at, at the Michigan Festival, or other festivals. Even before Michigan added a Jewish space, the Gulf Coast Women's Festival in Mississippi scheduled a Passover Seder for the entire festival, right from the first GCWF held in 1991, a tradition enhanced by the participation of the Jewish artists who performed at GCWF. Sue Fink and Laura Berkson, among others, lent their very beautiful voices to singing the blessings. Intended for local women, Gulf Coast drew in a markedly smaller number of Jewish participants than any other festival, so that the Seder frequently consisted of five Jewish performers explaining the ritual to 60 recovering Baptists. However, the determined multiculturalism of the Hensons, as producers of this radical event, had very real consequences, which offered an object lesson to everyone involved in coalition building. The Methodist summer camp rented for the first Gulf Coast Festival in 1991 broke its contract for 1992 after learning about the Jewish Seder. Frustrated with her ongoing search for low-cost, accessible, women-only land, Wanda Henson's opening speech at the 1992 festival began with, quote, Sisters, here is how anti-Semitism directly affects our lives, end quote. She later published her speech in various feminist newsletters, such as Baltimore's Amazon Times, explaining, quote, The reason we were denied access the next year was anti-Semitism. The board of the camp just couldn't believe we were conducting a Seder at our festival, end quote. At the Michigan Festival, we began with a Jewish table and then gained a Jewish tent. But the festival also saw new commitment to Jewish visibility, with many years of stage performances by Jewish artists. Charming hostess, Mikva, Div Divan, 
Isle of Klesbos. The scheduling of some acts on Friday night was an appropriate opportunity for hundreds of Jewish festigoers, fresh from Shabbat services, to dance at the foot of the stage. The first time that happened, one woman later described it as akin to seeing a goddess greeting card come to life. When slam poet Alex Olson's grandmother shared the horror, or artists left the stage to dance, the generational lineup of bodies and music made a further imprint on the hearts and minds of those watching. By 1997, a participation, as participation peaked in the Jewish tent, we are finding a greater range of Jewish lesbian issues covered by a variety of LGBT periodicals. That summer, both Out Magazine and The Advocate addressed Jewish lesbian pride in different features. The June 1997 issue of Out featured a music profile with Klezmaniacs, wait, Klezmantics, a Yiddish folk band with a lesbian violinist from the Bronx, Alicia, Alicia Spiegels, who declared, quote, We have to contend with what I call Jewish low self-esteem. It used to be that being Jewish and cultivating an identity on the margin provided a model for being gay. Now, we're drawing on the queer national, nation model. Being in your face had provided a model for being Jewish, end quote. The July 22nd issue of The Advocate inquired, after religious acceptance, what then? In a feature called Members of the Tribe, celebrating the recent endorsement by reform rabbis of same-sex civil marriage and offering a preview of the forthcoming documentary about Orthodox lesbians and gay men. Sandy Dabowski's Trembling Before G-D, it doesn't say God, <clears throat> That same summer, the Michigan Festival's large worker community finally made anti-Semitism and Jewish stereotyping the topic of its annual two-hour all-crew workshop, traditionally convened in folding chairs on the night stage several evenings before the gates opened to festigoers. The exercise introduced for this occasion, Michael Teller's stand-up sit-down anti-Semitism, allows non-Jewish participants to see the ways in which Jewish in which Jews experienced daily backlash. Workers watched uncomfortably as their Jewish crewmates, also uncomfortably, stood up each time a statement was read out loud. Stand up if you have ever heard that you do not look Jewish. I was on my feet in seconds. Stand up if you have ever been held responsible for the actions of Israel. If you have ever been afraid to wear something identifying you as Jewish. If you have ever had demand demeaning jokes about Jewish women told to your face. It was a 21 point, a 22 point list with knees creaking as we stood and sat. It appeared that these things had happened to nearly every Jewish woman in the worker community and sometimes on the land. By the end of the exercise, our physical discomfort from this up and down checklist of routine stereotyping had made more of an impact on our coworkers than anything else. Breaking into small groups for further discussion, we heard non-Jewish crewmates weep openly telling us Nothing in my education told me about the Jewish people, or I heard my own lover speak tonight about issues so deeply personal they'd never been addressed through our years of intimacy. Finally, one woman said, I thought Jew baiting was something in the past, yet tonight I heard many young workers speak of recent experiences. And a kitchen worker was so moved by what she learned that night that she baked an entire cheesecake for the Jewish woman who had organized the workshop. Both Penny Rosenwasser, the longtime festival worker and peace activist who had helped set up the workshop, and I ended up writing articles about this experience. Penny's essay, which appeared in Lilith in summer 2000, declared, quote, For at least one moment, moment the isolation and visibility of anti-Semitism crumbled and a fragile layer of trust was forged. Something had changed. After 28 years of working for social change, for the first time in my life, I sensed what liberation might really feel like, end quote. But it didn't last.
The downturn. A variety of factors contributed to the packing up of the Jewish tent. Over time, fewer women elected to attend the Michigan festival. Thanks to decades of political work, there were more LGBT-friendly vacation choices, including hotels and resorts for aging for an aging lesbian population less inclined to camp out. Some younger women began to boycott the festival, calling for greater inclusion of trans women. For those women who did continue attending, the ratio of Jewish festigoers remained high, but Michigan was first and foremost a clothing optional music festival in the woods. With round the clock choices from concerts, theater, dance, to shopping in the crafts area and some very sex positive workshops, many Jewish festigoers preferred to leave serious issues at home, indulging in the pleasures of romance and laughter and campfire party ambiance. After more than a decade of debates and drama, and workshops and weddings in the Jewish women's tent space, by 2005, only a few festigoers were involved daily. Most preferred to get in their blast of Am Yisrael on Friday night's Shabbat service. Others actually began avoiding the tent, as criticism of Israel led to tense discussions on the land. And that peaked in 2002, when the festival's opening ceremonies included a pointed critique of Israel's occupation with a woman in black parade featuring three signs demanding end the occupation. While many women appreciated the peace process theme of the opening ceremonies that year, Jewish women were completely unprepared for the singling out of Israel at a ceremony that since 1985 had always included an unpartisan international welcome, often featuring Hebrew and Yiddish greetings. And as the obvious liaison to the Jewish constituency on the land, I was concerned that no one involved in planning the opening show thought to alert or include me. As this chapter makes plain, Jewish women at, are present in women's music audiences in substantial numbers, far exceeding the percentage of Jews in the overall U.S. population. Unprepared for the critique of Israel, individual Jewish women reacted strongly. Some began heckling. Needless to say, those festigoers who were in, for, in fact from Israel were placed in an awkward position, not foisted upon their other campers, some of whom hailed from very homophobic and repressive nation states. The Jewish tent then became a place where anxiety over who defended Israel and who didn't replaced all other considerations, and each visitor looked to me to set a specific tone. Some wanted to begin Shabbat with a declaration of love for Israel. Others wanted to begin with a firm party line of disassociation from Zionism. A newly out Orthodox woman wept that no matter what we resolved from the week at Michigan, Jews were locked in a painful struggle and turning weapons on others as Israel sold Israeli soldiers forcibly removed ultra-Orthodox activists from illegal settlements. The result that I began to see, sorry, the result was that I began to see Jewish women avoid gathering as a group in any way that put Jewish identity on the defensive. For example, several efforts to set up a Black Jewish dialogue on racism and anti-Semitism failed to generate any interest. The festigoer community was weary of conflict. In contrast, the worker community backstage managed to stay continually engaged in discussions on Palestinian land rights while also hosting an annual worker Shabbat meal open to all. Much of that was due to the tireless energy of Penny Rosenwasser, who while completing her dissertation on internalized anti-Semitism, arranged to show the worker community a moving documentary she'd participated in called The Way Home. Devoted to ending the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories, Penny eventually published her award-winning volume, Hope Into Practice, Jewish Women, Choosing, Jewish Women Choosing Justice Despite Our Own Fears, in 2013. The book explored each of the internalized conflicts experienced by progressive Jews at progressive events. Our informal division of labor at the festival, Penny initiating Jewish justice actions in the worker community, me a liaison to the Jewish festigoers, 
approximated the way a university program had one director for graduate studies and another for undergraduates. Penny and I agreed that, ideally, Jewish women should always be on the front lines of peace activism. Yet I also wondered if it were not another form of bias to expect that Jewish women attending the Michigan Festival should spend their time confronting Israeli policies while thousands of non-Jewish sisters relaxed on blankets, eating ice cream, kissing, and enjoying concerts. This downturn, with the Jewish tent attracting less participation, corresponded to a period when the festival as a whole had lower attendance and had to scale back financially, combining several work areas and eliminating some long-held crew positions. Interestingly, at the same time, there was an obvious lesbian baby boom in the community and a demand for more child-friendly spaces and campsites. Thus, in 2005, I agreed to return our much-coveted, centrally located tent space to the other groups for multi-use activities at the festival, and the Jewish tent became the teen tent. With the help of other Jewish women, there was a smooth transition back to networking through hangouts, scheduled workshops, and the always popular Shabbat, Shabbat celebrations. Camper Alex Cullen set up what she dubbed the Red Tent after Anita Diamant's book, Indifferently Abled Camping, and took over the facilitation of a new gathering space that was more accessible to all. Still, a quick flip through the guest book I always left out in the Jewish tent reveals how much the space meant to us in the, in the early years and why visibility matters. Quote, I live in a community where the Jewish population is small and very conservative. Just six months ago, the congregation voted to count women in the minion. Although I go to services, it is not a welcoming congregation. It feels wonderful to be here where I'm accepted and even appreciated. Quote, Interacting with Jewish women at the festival is when I feel most comfortable, in fact, immediately at home. I let down my guard. I look forward to the peaceful Shabbat, which I don't seem to be able to find at home. As a woman-identified Jew, I have found some like-minded friends at home who then turned up here. Quote, this past year has been the start of my search for a Jewish identity that has true meaning for me, and being at this festival has been my first milestone. I consider myself simultaneously a Jew and a witch. Quote, here I am, here I am, able to let down my guard as a Jewish woman. I find a peaceful Shabbat where here, oh my gosh, Kim, here I am able to let down my guard as a Jewish woman. I find a peaceful Shabbat here which I don't seem to be able to find at home as a woman-identified Jew. Quote, The Yiddish singing connected me to my ancestors in a way that wasn't just connecting me to a male god. Quote, This festival feeds a deeper hunger for the rest of the Jewish lesbian culture. I feel truly nourished. I will carry with me in my soul to cherish as I move forward on my path the voices of Jewish women singing that I heard here.
Fifteen summers of notebooks sing to me. We had something there. If the influence of Jewish lesbian activism is to be remembered and inscribed, greater efforts must be made to acknowledge Jewish leadership in the women's music movement preceding Riot Girl and Lilith Fair. As noted in Chapter 1, both Riot Girl and Lilith Fair gained mainstream recognition for building upon male and potentially heterosexual models of rock venue radicalism. Riot Girl's separatist stance was in its female-only mosh pit, and Lilith Fair included male backup musicians and male union venue techies. Eventually, when other women's music genres aren't explored, Jewish leadership therein disappears from the record and achievement. So record of achievement. In fall 2011, I attended a workshop at my university advertised as Jewish Women Who Rock, a freewheeling conversation about pop music, gender, and Jewish identity. Led by Sarah Marcus, author of Girls to the Front, The True Story of the Riot Girl Revolution. And Nona Willis Aronowitz, daughter of the rock critic Ellen Willis. The panel addressed some of the pop music's Jewish songwriters, example, Carol King but brushed off the entire women's music movement and, by extension, festival culture as stodgy. I sat in the second row, making list after list of the Jewish lesbian feminist musicians, producers, techies, distributors, and sound engineers I could name, none of whom were mentioned in a presentation promising how Jewish identities enacted by women musicians. If Jewish identity has to be enacted by women on stage, the ways that lesbian identity informs Jewish visibility and vice versa remains uncomfortable or invisible conversation for the best of feminist historians. August, not too long ago, the members of Divan, artists specializing in Jewish sacred music with Middle East roots, perform on stage at the Michigan Women's Music Festival. Their lead singer is a cantor, the daughter of cantors. She is also very pregnant. Hundreds of women, bare-breasted, dance the hora at the foot of the stage. Most have just arrived from the goddess-themed Shabbat ceremony in the ferns. Two women have just had a commitment ceremony, and the dancers suddenly gather in the inn to lift them up, still seated in their camp chairs above our heads in the traditional Jewish wedding celebration of bride and groom. Here we have two brides, in that split second, thousands of women in the audience with no previous exposure to Jewish life are told to get up and join the dance, take part in the blessing, in its simcha, a shared happiness, get up, and those in wheelchairs are assisted with a modified horror of their own. Out of nowhere, cookies are produced, and a challah loaf, and wine. L'chaim, brides. Someone chants the Song of Songs. I sprained two muscles attempting a Russian... dance, and tears flow freely as daughters of Holocaust survivors reflect that lesbians, too, were rounded up for Hitler's death camps. We've survived to make this happen, this bride wedding. A first-time festigoer from Brooklyn is not sure what she's seeing. Is this really happening? Two, bride lifted, two brides lifted up to an open sky? It's real, I assure her. Five thousand women saw it not so long ago.